You will have my attention if you can demonstrate to me from the Bible that the spirit of someone is a different person to the owner of the spirit. If you can prove that, you have my attention. But just proving that the spirit is a person, I can agree with that. We can save ourselves both the time and say, amen, we agree with that. Let's, let's get to the point where, how do you think that the spirit being a person is a different person to Christ? We have introduced another teacher of truth besides Christ. That's outrageous if you're a Christian. I want to get uh, straight into our subject matter. And uh, what we want to talk about this morning is uh, a topic that will require you to, to do some thinking. It might be a little bit, uh, a little bit different to what, you've, uh, to what you've heard before, what you're accustomed to hear. We're going to be talking about a parable today, one of the parables of Christ. And chances are, before you switch off, chances are you have never, ever heard about this parable before. There's a very high chance that you haven't. Uh, I certainly have not. It's not some secret thing, uh, you know, a new thing that uh, it's in the Gospels. But uh, we know that in the Scriptures, one of the most common ways that Jesus taught was through parables. Many times. As a matter of fact, it's uh, uh, something that many Gospel harmonies like to do, is to list the count of parables that Jesus gave. Uh, and the count changes a little bit, you know, to find the order and the chronology of all these parables. Uh, but uh, commonly, uh, Luke has the most parables, 28 parables that Jesus gave. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew has 23, that's the next, and Mark has nine parables. And you'll find that many of these chronologies and commentaries, they will actually list all the parables as being found in the first three Gospels, what, we, what are referred to as the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And no parables are listed in the Gospel of John. John stands as a unique Gospel, very different in many ways to the other three Gospels, to the other uh, synoptic Gospels. And uh, like I said, many of the commentaries will uh, tell you that there are no parables in the Gospel of John. Now, the differences, I want to highlight some of the differences because we want to explore that a little bit. Uh, John, the Gospel of John leaves out some very significant events and details that are mentioned in the other Gospels. For example, the temptation of Christ in the wilderness, you don't find it in the Gospel of John. That's a pretty important event, right? Yeah. We learn about that from the Synoptic Gospels, from the other three writers. The transfiguration of Christ. Uh, none of the parables that are recorded in the other Gospels appear in, in John. And uh, the Sermon on the Mount is not there. The Lord's Prayer is not there. Not even one instance of Christ casting out a demon. John does not record any of that. It's quite uh, unique and different. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the Gospel of John includes many things that the other three Gospel writers don't mention. Things that are unique only to John and that appear only in his Gospel. For example, Christ's early ministry in Galilee. Christ's first miracle at the wedding, turning the water into wine. We only know about that because John recorded that for us. Christ's two trips to Jerusalem before his arrest and his trial. Only John talks about that. Uh, things like private interviews with Nicodemus, with the woman at the well, unique only to John's gospel. Even the famous miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. It only appears in, in John. And uh, the one we want to focus on today is the speech or the discourse that Jesus gave to his disciples after the Last Supper. Only John records in detail this particular speech, because in the other Gospels you find that the Last Supper finishes, they go out, and Jesus is arrested. And you get the impression that it just happened straight away. They finished and he went out, he's arrested, and, and the events uh, roll on. But in John you get a little bit more of an insight that there is more that happened. There is this lengthy discourse that Jesus gave his disciples. And in this, it goes for about four chapters, at the end of which Jesus prays in John 17, and then he is arrested and the events follow on from there. And in this farewell speech, this discourse, we want to focus on this parable that Jesus gave. And the parable I want to talk about today is the parable of the comforter. The parable of the 
comforter. I have never ever heard about the parable of the comforter. And chances are pretty high that you haven't either. Why am I saying the parable of the comforter? You see, because it's only in this part of the gospel, of all the four gospel writers, only, only John records this. And in all the gospel of John, this is the only place that John records where Jesus actually spoke about the comforter. And in speaking about the comforter, Jesus actually indicates that he was speaking in a manner that is common to his teaching method. That's the manner of parables. That's why I'm saying it's called the parable of the comforter. Let's open our Bibles to John 16. I just want to start at the end here. And then we're going to go back and see. Sometimes it's good to start at the end. John chapter 16. What is this parable of the comforter? Verse 25. John 16 and verse 25. Here Jesus speaking and he says, These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh <clears throat> when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. Now if you have a margin in your Bible there, What's another word for Proverbs? Okay, it says parables in your Bible, right? Other Bibles will put illustration. What was Jesus talking about? He just finished saying something to his disciples, and then he's telling them, he's concluding what he's saying, he's saying, listen, these things that I've communicated to you, these things that I've spoken to you, I was speaking to you in Proverbs or in parables. What things? One of the things that he spoke about is the comforter. Because you have to go back and see what the chapters that precede the speech and the chapters that precede, what's included there, he is saying these things were communicated in a proverb or in a parable. There are parables. That's why I'm saying it's the parable of the comforter. Interesting. The only time ever that Jesus spoke about the comforter is recorded by John. And the only time that Jesus spoke about the comforter was not in a public speech or a sermon that he gave. It only happened at the farewell speech after the Last Supper with his disciples. And so we want to explore what did Jesus mean when he spoke about the comforter? Because today this is one of the most misunderstood things that Jesus ever spoke about. This particular parable according to him. Now... What's, uh, what's the definition for a parable? If we talk about a parable, now it's interesting to note uh, that the word for parable that appears here in John is a different to a word to what appears in the other Gospels where Jesus spoke in parables. But there's an overlap in meaning. We don't want to miss that. So I just want to mention that, that this is something some people say, oh, well, this is a different word. But the meaning is he's speaking in a way that is not to be taken plainly, according to the verse that we just read. Isn't that right? If you look at the verse, it says, These things are spoken to you in parables, or in Proverbs, but a time will come when I will not speak to you in Proverbs, but I will show you plainly. So whatever he was saying cannot be taken as plain speech, correct? It's not plain speech, it's not direct, it's not literal, it is representative, it is allegorical, it is symbolic, it is metaphorical, it is parabolic. Whatever, all these words have all these meanings, you with me? And this is what he's saying. So what was he talking about? What is he referring to here? If we look at the word, the, the one I want to focus on, because he spoke a number of parables. He says, these things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs or in parables. There are things. The one I want to focus on is the parable of the comforter. And the reason why I mention that is because the word comforter only appears in the, all the Gospels in this section of the Gospels only. It's nowhere else in the other three Gospels, and nowhere else in the Gospel of John in this section only does it appear, and it appears only four times. We're going to look at all four instances this morning, so we can ascertain exactly and see what did Jesus mean when he spoke about this comforter. The passage actually begins in chapter 14. The reason why many people don't recognize or, or realize that what Jesus was saying here was in, in parables is that Jesus did not introduce the discussion this way. He actually says it at the end. Not like in other places where he says in the, in the other Gospels, Hear ye the parable of the sower. 
And then he goes, you know straight away why you're about to read is a parable, because it's introduced this way. He doesn't do that in John. He actually begins speaking. It's at the conclusion of his speech that he tells them, listen, these things I spoke to you in parables. And because his speech happens to be a bit lengthy, it covers a few chapters, many people don't make the connection that what he's saying at the conclusion applies to the whole thing. And so it's missed and it's not read as Jesus intended to communicate it. And so it's misunderstood. You with me? And so we want to look at the context. When we're looking at the context here, we're not just looking at the previous verse and the next verse. We're looking at a bit of a bigger context of the chapters in that area, that whole speech. That whole speech was given at one time. It was one discourse. It could have easily been put in one chapter. It was just divided up for uh, convenience. Now, the beginning, like I said, the commencement of that is in chapter 14. And it's the only time in all of the teachings of Jesus that we read about this comforter. And so it's vital for us to understand what is being spoken of and what is being referred to. There are a number, a number of other... So, uh, before I go on, contrary to popular belief of uh, what the commentaries tell us, that there are no parables in John, there are parables in John. Jesus spoke a few of them. In this passage, we have a few of them. One of them is the parable of the comforter. Another one is the vine and the branches. That's a parable, right? There's also another parable in John about the good shepherd. That's also spoken of as a parable. And also he's spoken of another parable in this section where he talks about the woman who uh, gives, and the, and the gate and the door, that's right, that's with the good shepherd. And uh, the woman that gives birth and travails, but then when a child is born, there's great joy. That was part of these many, or, or these parables, these proverbs that he spoke to them about. So contrary to popular ideas, there are parables in the Gospel of John, unique only to John. And something we want to learn from today is this parable of the Comforter. This misunderstood parable of the Comforter has given rise to one of the most bizarre and outrageous beliefs that exist about God's Spirit. Namely, that God's Spirit is a different person to the Father and the Son. Someone who goes by the popular and unbiblical name of God, the Holy Spirit. That idea is primarily based on a misunderstanding of this passage that we're dealing with today. So this is why I want to explore it. This is why I want to examine it. So let's go to the Bible. First occurrence of Comforter. Here it is, John 14 and verse 16. We're not far, so we're going in the same context of the time where Jesus was speaking here after supper. John 14 and verse 16, and for the first time ever, the disciples hear the word comforter come out of the lips of Christ. This is the first mention ever. Very significant. We can't miss that. He says, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. This is the proof text that the comforter is someone else other than Christ. In the top you know, five, this, is probably, this probably ranks as number one. People say, see, didn't Jesus say another comforter? It must be someone else. This is what we want to explore. But before we explore it, because Jesus does explain himself. Uh, I want to first explore why Jesus began to speak in parables to his disciples. I want to look at the introduction of what was happening before Jesus th said these words, because they help us understand what is Jesus trying to communicate. And to understand that, we need to go back just a few verses. We'll start in verse 6. Notice what Jesus says in John 14 and verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Very famous words of Jesus. But these key points I want us to keep in mind, they will help us understand the passage and the discourse that we're focusing on today. The only way to God, to the Father, is Christ. Is there any other way? Are you sure about that? Utterly exclusive, very key point to help us understand the passages that follow. Jesus is the only way. And, and notice what he goes on to say in verse 7. If he had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. He's communicating to his disciples this precious truth that he's the only way to the Father. He's the only one that can truly reveal the Father. And the fact that he has been with them is evidence that they have seen the Father and know the Father. 
So his point here is about revealing who? The Father. That's his point. That's what he's trying to communicate with his disciples. He's about to be arrested. He knows what's going to happen. And in these last moments, he's trying to convey to them some deep spiritual truths. And then suddenly, someone pipes up from the class and asks a very disappointing question to Jesus in the next verse. Verse 8. And Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Here is Jesus trying to communicate a deep truth. He's the only way to the Father. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know the Father. And then Philip says, Lord, just show us the Father, and that'll be enough. You can sense the disappointment in, in, in what comes next, in how Jesus responds to, to Philip. And what Philip expressed was probably some thought that wasn't only in Philip's mind, okay? It was probably something that was expressive of what others might have been thinking and wondering. Jesus is talking about the Father. We just want to see the Father, you know, show, show us the Father. So Philip says it. And the disappointment is very evident in the next verse. Notice what Jesus says. Jesus saith unto him, verse 9, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? There's some disconnect here. Jesus is telling them a deep truth and they're not getting it. And it's evidenced by Philip's question. And Jesus says, Philip, he's surprised. He's disappointed. He says, how can you even say that, Philip? You don't get it. You don't get it. I've been with you all this time. And you're still telling me, show us the Father? And this is what gives rise. This is the launching point for where Christ begins to communicate and to speak about revealing the Father. But he now begins to speak, not plainly, but in... <coughs> parables and and the subject matter of his speech is revealing the father to them and that he is the only way to reveal the father this is what they've been discussing it's the questions that popped up that causes christ now to go into speaking in a certain way because obviously there was something that's being missed verse 10 believest thou not that i am in the father and the father in me the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Key point here we also want to keep in mind. So from this point, Christ begins to address this question and he begins to answer it in this proverb, in this allegory, a series of proverbs and allegories to illustrate the point that he wants to bring across. The point that he is making. But as we go into this passage, some key points I want us to keep in mind. The passage is about revealing who? The Father, the Father to the disciples. This is what was burdening Christ. And the only one qualified, the only way to, uh, for us to see, or for them or for anyone, to see the Father is through, through Christ. And then the other point I want us to keep in mind comes out in verse 10 that we just read. That Christ is where? In the, in the Father, and the Father is? In Christ. This relationship is what qualifies Christ to be the only way to the Father. The Father dwells where? In Christ. And because the Father dwells in Christ, He told His disciples, listen, if you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. And they missed that. They said, just show us the Father and be enough. So now He's going to go explain in detail to, to like children in a class, to give illustrations so they can get the point that they're not really getting initially. That there is this connection between him and the Father. The Father dwells in him. He dwells in the Father. And he is the only way to the Father. And his whole purpose is to reveal to them the Father. If you don't keep these points in mind, guaranteed you're going to misunderstand the rest of the passage. Guaranteed. This is what Christ is dealing with. This is the launching point for when he begins to talk about the comforter. So now we go back to verse 16, and notice what he says, And I will pray the Father. So is he praying? Who is he asking this from? The Father. I'll pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Verse 17, Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Who is he speaking about? Okay, let's, there's a different answers here. It really depends who you ask, I guess, huh? and what you believe and who you ask. He's praying the Father. He's asking the Father. The Father will give 
this comforter, first time he talks about this Christ, and then he says that he may abide with you forever. Who is going to abide with them forever? The comforter. He's talking about, who, who did, think earlier, who did they see and know because Christ was with them? The Father. Isn't that right? He told them, you see him, now you know him, I've been with you all the time. So the, he's going to pray the Father, the Father will send this comforter, that he may abide with them forever. Who's the he referring to? The Father. The whole point is that there is, the whole point of Christ's coming is to connect sinful man with the Father. Correct? So now he's speaking in parables. And you can't take his, his speech as plain speech. You can't take what he's saying literally when he says another comfort. Oh, see, another, someone else. He's speaking in a parable. We're going to come to that in a minute. But notice how verse 17 explains it. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. Who did they know that he just told them earlier? The Father. He says, you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. How did they know the Father who was dwelling with them? How was the Father dwelling with them? Because that connection between the Father and Christ is that the Father dwells where? In Christ, and Christ dwells in the Father. This is what he's talking about. You with me? Notice how he explains it in verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. This is how the Father dwells with the disciples. When Christ comes, as Christ was here in the flesh, he told his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. They missed it. They said, just show us the Father. So now he goes into detail explaining this in simplified illustrations. Saying, listen, I'll pray the Father, I'll give you this other comforter. That way, he will abide with you forever. I will not leave you comfortless. I am coming to you. How the Father dwells with the believer is by Christ coming to dwell in us. Because Christ does not come independent of the Father. He comes and who dwells in him? The Father. You see the point? And this is what Christ is communicating. Because the only way for us to be connected with the Father is through Christ. So this comforter, this other comforter, cannot be anyone other than the Son or the Father. There is no other way. Now, the difficulty arises here is because someone will say, but hold on, brother. Let's be honest. It does say another comforter. It sounds like someone else. And to that I say, yes, it does sound like someone else. It's a parable. It's a parable. Why are you reading it as plain speech when Jesus himself says, I'm not speaking plainly. It is a proverb, a parable, an illustration. Nobody deals with this passage this way. Everybody who misunderstands this passage reads it as plain speech. In other words, takes it exactly as it means. That's not the point of a parable. A parable requires interpretation, explanation. It has a meaning that is not obvious in the words that are literal. For example, I'll give you an illustration of this. One of the most common Misunderstood doctrines in Christianity today is that when you die, you go where? To heaven or, or to hell. One of the key passages that are used to defend this teaching is a story that Jesus gave. You know which story? Lazarus. The rich man and Lazarus. Thank you. You remember that? Briefly, they both die. Lazarus is carried into Abraham's bosom. The rich man is, goes to a place of torment. Now, Jesus there was giving a parable. You realize that? An illustrative truth. And it doesn't matter how much Bible passages you might produce from other parts of the Bible, that the dead know nothing, their memory, their thinking is all gone, they are asleep, there is no consciousness in death. doesn't matter how much of these verses you bring. People seem to just only see this passage of the rich man and Lazarus and to read it in a certain way and come to a certain conclusion. In like manner. We have this problem with misunderstanding the Spirit of God. And it doesn't matter how much Bible verses you produce, people seem to be stuck on this part of the Bible that says another comforter, and that's it. And it's the same way. It's misunderstanding a parable in both cases to come up with a misunderstood teaching. You see the point, I hope. Now the disciples understood who was coming. That the identity of the comforter was not someone 
different. They understood that much from the passage. What they didn't understand was how it would be different. We know that because a question again is asked. And it's interesting, these interactions, the questions that the disciples ask and the way Jesus answers them gives us a very, very important insight as to the understanding of what's going on. Verse 22, we're in John 14. Notice verse 22. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world. According to what Judas understood, who did he understand was coming and going to manifest himself to them? He's speaking to Christ. He says, how is it that thou, or you, how will you manifest yourself to us and not unto the world? They were clear on who was coming, correct? What they were not clear on was how it would be different. You see the point? Today, many people misunderstand who is coming. They think someone else is coming. That's not what the disciples understood. They just did not understand how Christ would be different. You see, the other comforter is none other than Christ continuing to reveal the Father in a more personal way. The difference is it would not happen in the flesh like he was here on earth. It would happen internally on a spiritual level. That's why he says the Father was dwelling with them and he shall be in them. And how the Father gets to be in them and in the believer is by sending this other comforter the only way that connects him with the believer. The only way happens to be Christ. This is what Christ was communicating. So the disciples understood at least that much that he wasn't talking about someone different to him or to his father. Today, that is not understood as much. Today, that is most commonly misunderstood. You know, there is a whole, this last quarter, there was a whole Sabbath school lesson on the Holy Spirit. You remember that? It's not too far in, 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 you know, in history. It's just a few months ago, not even a few months ago, last quarter. One of the key passages to promote the idea that the Spirit is someone other than the Father or the Son is this passage right here. That is no better than the Christians trying to prove that when you die, you go to heaven and hell. And the key passage that is used is the parable or the story of the rich man and Lazarus. It's the same thing. The disciples never came to that conclusion. So that's the first occurrence. Jesus says it very well. He explains himself. I'll not leave you comfortless. I'll come to you. Second occurrence of comforter. We're going to look at all of them today, okay? It's verse 25. John 14, 25. The next time Jesus mentions this word, comforter. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Jesus here says, he was speaking while he was yet with them. And there is an unspoken implication here. And the unspoken impl implication is explained in the next verse by saying, I'm speaking while I'm yet with you, but the Holy Spirit will continue to speak. The implication is, I will continue speaking, but not while I'm with you in the same way. Something is going to change. There's not going to be a change of speakers. There's going to be a change of manner of speaking. You with me? A lot of people think there is a change of speakers. Jesus came and spoke to the disciples. He's done speaking. He leaves. He sends someone else to continue teaching. We don't have another teacher. So he says here, the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. That's the question. Do we have another teacher other than Christ? Do we have another teacher qualified like Christ? Christ told us he is the only way to the Father. Because think about it. What is this teaching all about? What's the point of the teaching? Is to reveal who? The Father to the disciples. That's the whole discourse. That's the passage. That's the purpose of sending the Comforter so that the Father may abide with the disciples forever. So how can you have another teacher other than Christ and be qualified to be the way to bring you and to reveal to you the Father? When Jesus says, I am the, the way. 
he teaches all things. Someone say, but look, brother, honestly now, he says, he shall teach you all things. It doesn't say I, it doesn't say me. It says, he shall teach you all things. Come on, that's someone else. I know it sounds like someone else. It's a parable. How many other places did Jesus speak about himself like he was someone else? I'll give you an example. One time, Jesus said, when the Son of Man cometh, and all the angels with him, he shall send his angels to gather his elect from all the four corners of the earth. Who is the Son of Man? You sure about that? Because he says he will send his angels. Right? So he was speaking about, him, he was speaking about himself as if he was someone else. So in this parable, Jesus says the Comforter, he will teach you. That's not the only one. There's another one. When Jesus says, you know, he... On the Son of Man, he will sit and he will separate between the sheep and the goats. Who's that Son of Man? Christ. The other parable that Jesus gave in John, John chapter 10. Jesus says, the good shepherd leads his sheep and, and they follow him and they know his voice and he does all these things, he opens the door and all these things. Who's this good shepherd? You sure? But he says he, as if he was talking about someone else. We know it's Christ because Christ says what? I am the good shepherd. And he was speaking in a parable there, the same word that's used referring to this passage. So why do we come to this passage and then say, oh, but the comforter here has to be someone else? It's tradition that forces us to read it this way. The same Christ who says, I am the good shepherd, the he that leads with his voice and does all these things, I am the good shepherd, is the same one who said about the other comforter, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Tradition is a very dangerous thing, brothers and sisters. You know, the teaching that the Comforter is someone other than the Father or the Son is a really outrageous insult to Christ. We hear it so often, we're used to it. But it is a ludicrous and outrageous teaching to, to say that. I want to ex explain to you why I'm saying that and why I'm saying it so strongly. If I was a person who would come with a Bible study or something and try and tell you, listen, you know the Good Shepherd is not Jesus, it's someone other than Jesus. What would you think of me? you think I was crazy, right? If you're honest. Heretic, crazy, what the, good luck trying to prove that. Right? It's outrageous. It is no less alarming and outrageous to suggest that the Comforter is someone other than Christ. The problem is we're, we hear it so often, we're so used to it, so we're desensitized to it. If I was to try and prove to you that Good Shepherd is someone other than Christ, because Jesus says he will do this and he will do that, and, and this is how he explained it, and, and, and so on and so forth, you'd laugh at me. We have, brothers and sisters, Bible studies, Sabbath school lessons written to try and prove that the Comforter is someone other than Christ. That is a grave insult to Christ. Christ would be insulted if I was to give the credit that is due to him as the Good Shepherd and say, no, no, it's someone else. This good shepherd is someone else. We should thank this other good shepherd. That's the same problem. We say, no, no, the comforter is someone else. We should thank him. He helps us. You know, there's Christ over here and there's someone else. We are discrediting and we are dishonoring Christ to that much degree when we give the credit that is due to him to someone else. You see the point? That's why it's not, it's not a light thing. It's a very, very serious thing. In the interlude, chapter 15, Christ deals with the parable of the vine and the branches. We're not going to get into it in detail, but briefly. The vine and the branches, there are three outstanding uh, components to that parable. The husbandman, the vine, and the branches. Correct? The husbandman represents who? The father. The vine is Christ. The branches are? The disciples. You know, this parable is given to confirm and teach the same thing. It's about revealing the Father. The Father is the source of life. He's the one who nourishes. He's the one who tends and cares for the vine and the branches. The branches can only benefit as they are connected to the vine. And the life or the sap flows through the vine to the branches. That connecting link between all three is the vine. It is Christ. The way to the father. So he's illustrating the same truth in another parable, in another form. It's still the same thing. 
the Comforter is none other than him. Third occurrence, John 15, verse 26. John 15, 26. Jesus continues here, and now he says the word Comforter for the third time. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Here it is now, the Comforter, he will come. Who sends him this time? Look at the text carefully, okay? We, we got to be careful what it says. Who sends the Comforter? Jesus sends him, right? So the first time he mentions, he says, I'll pray the Father, he will send you the Comforter. Now Jesus says, the Comforter, I will send him to you from the Father. No, no, no doubt. So we're not, we're not ignoring that. We're just being uh, specific with what Christ said. He calls him the Spirit of Truth. And then he says, it comes from where? It proceeds or comes out from the Father. Key point here. And then at the end he says, he shall testify of me. And this is the point a lot of people grasp, uh, you know, and say, hold on. See, it says, this comforter testifies of Christ. It has to be someone other than Christ. We'll see about that. But first of all, the comforter is sent by Christ from the Father. It proceeds from the Father. It's also called the spirit of truth. Who said, I am the way and the truth and the life? Christ. And this comforter is called the spirit of truth. And Jesus is the truth. And then the other thing is, this spirit proceeds from where? From the Father. Who said, I was in the Father and dwelling in the Father? Right? He said that to Philip earlier, remember? Don't you know that the Father is in me and I? In him. So this comforter that proceeds from the Father cannot be referring to anyone other than than he who dwells in the Father. You see the point? What about testifying of me? People say, see, it sounds like someone else there. He testifies of Christ. Yeah, it sounds like someone else, of course, because you have to keep in mind, Jesus was giving a, a parable. How does it, or how does the Spirit testify of Christ? You see, when God sends that Spirit, this other comforter into your heart, that testifies, that confirms that the words of Christ and the promise of Christ was real. That's the realization of it. A testimony is a confirmation. It's a witness. It's making real that which was promised. That's how the Spirit testifies of Christ. It gives witness. It makes real what Christ said to his disciples. It's a fulfillment of the promise. Notice what John 14, 20 says, just to see how this is confirmed. John chapter 14 and verse 20. I'm in 13. Let me look at 14 and verse 20. And it says here, At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. What day is that? What day is he referring to when he says, that, that, that day you're going to know that I am in my Father, you are in me, I am in you. The day when these words are fulfilled, right? When this promise of this comforter is fulfilled. When the spirit of truth is sent to dwell with them. What day did that happen? The day of Pentecost. In other words, the, what it will testify, it will testify to the fact that Christ indeed is in the Father, the Father is in Him, and Christ dwelling in His disciples is how the Father continues to dwell with them forever. That's what it's talking about, brothers and sisters. Amen. That's the testimony that is given. That's the whole burden of this passage. It's Christ revealing the Father to the disciples in a personal, intimate way. He doesn't me, he doesn't need someone else. He wasn't talking about some new element, some new player in the picture that's going to do that because somehow Christ is incapable or cannot do that. Christ is talking about how he will do it in a more personal way. So he starts speaking in parables and he gives the parable of the comforter. Speaking about himself. Just like he gave the parable of the good shepherd. And guess what? That's also about himself. It's inconsistent to teach that the Comforter is other than Christ. Listen, if you believe the Comforter is someone other than Christ, by right, you have to believe that the Good Shepherd is someone other than Christ. To be consistent. You have to. You have no license to interpret one this way and one the other way. That's inconsistent. That's, you are a victim of tradition when you do that. 
Fourth occurrence, John chapter 16. You with me so far? Yeah. Okay, still, we're still on the, same, on the same boat? I'm not leaving you behind, right? I'm not moving too fast? Okay. A little bit? Okay, maybe we can discuss more in the question. Because I want to make sure I want to cover all the, all the occurrences here. John 16 is occurrence number four. And I'll try and slow down a little bit. John 16 and verse 7. The final time Jesus speaks about the Comforter when he was with his disciples. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. People say here, see, there you go. It has to be someone else. It actually cannot be someone else. Because something had to happen to Christ himself before the Comforter could be sent. Something had to happen to the person of Christ. Elsewhere in John, it actually tells us Christ had to be... Go he says here, he has to go away. And the reason he has to go away is that he has to be glorified in order for the Comforter to come. Something had to happen to him because the Comforter is intr intrinsically linked to him. And only when he is glorified can this Comforter, can this Spirit be sent. Without that, the Spirit cannot be sent. You see, if it was someone else, Christ could have just easily sent him. No, it was linked to his very own person. Now, someone might say, but look, you know, the comforter has to be a person. And to that, I say, amen. Of course, the comforter is a person. Because Christ is a person. And when the comforter is, comes... It is no less of a real person. You see, when Christ, just because Christ comes to us, not in the flesh, but on an inner level, uh, on an inner internal level, in the spirit, it's no less of a person. It's not just some force or some essence. It's not just power. It is the very person of Christ, not a different person to Christ. See, a lot of people go to a lot of length, a lot of trouble, trying to prove that the spirit is a person. For example, you know, in the book of Acts, I see the, see the Spirit leads the church. The Spirit can be grieved. The Spirit said this, or the Spirit did that. And, and they pile up the evidence. Therefore, the Spirit must be a person. Amen. I agree with all that. But they think that in proving that the Spirit is a person, that it automatically proves that it's a different person to Christ. It doesn't. You will have my attention if you can demonstrate to me from the Bible that the spirit of someone is a different person to the owner of the spirit. If you can prove that, you have my attention. But just proving that the spirit is a person, I can agree with that. We can save ourselves both the time and say, amen, we agree with that. Let's, let's get to the point where how do you think that the spirit being a person is a different person to Christ? There is no evidence for that, brothers and sisters. It's a very dangerous conclusion to actually come to if you thought if you thought that about yourself or about other people here on earth we might uh, question your sanity correct say look my person and me and my person is someone else or and you would think there's something wrong with you how do we do that about the god we serve it's a very very serious and dangerous thing now, the departure of Christ, Jesus leaving, there was a difference here. Obviously, he was leaving, and it sounds like he's saying someone else is coming, but what he was referring to was there was a difference about how he will return. This difference, the disciples did not fully realize or understand. We see that in the question that Judas, not Iscariot, asked him. He says, how are, we, how are you going to do this, Lord? It's a question of how. And the misunderstanding of, Christ, of, the, of the disciples is they had no idea that Christ would die and actually have to leave them. Despite the fact that Jesus told them that repeatedly. Their idea was deeply entrenched of how Christ was going to be the Savior. He will sit and be king and he will kick the Romans and he will sit and rule and his disciples will sit and rule with him. This was their idea, right? Despite repeated instruction from Christ to the contrary. Why were they so deeply entrenched in this idea? Because of tradition. 
You see, these good Jewish boys, the disciples, they went to the Sabbath school in the synagogue from a little young age. And the Sabbath school teacher in the synagogue would tell them, you know, when the Messiah would come and these Roman soldiers that you see walking out on the street, you will destroy them and the Romans will be our servants. And then they grew up and they graduated from children's Sabbath school and they went to adult Sabbath school. And in their Sabbath school quarterly, back then, the equivalent, if you're with me, they would have been indoctrinated with the same thing. So deep is this indoctrination that the words of Christ were not able to overcome the deeply rooted preconceived ideas in the disciples' minds. Things have not changed much today, brothers and sisters. The same thing happens. People go and sit in church and they are told what the Bible says here about this and that and the other. And it seems to be incomprehensible how much Bible you try and open and show them. It seems impossible to overcome the deeply entrenched ideas that are held. Tradition, this is how strong tradition is. This is the barrier that Jesus was dealing with. This is the difficulty that Jesus was dealing with with the disciples. He expresses it in John 16 and verse 12. Notice what he says. Just a little further down from what we just read. John 16 and verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Why could they not bear them now? Because they were stuck in the ideas that they wanted to hold on to. It took the death of Christ to shake the disciples awake from these ideas, from this tradition, and make them realize Christ had a different plan to what they thought. That's what it took, a grave, severe disappointment. They all took off in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? They ran away, all of them. They did not expect that would happen. Many things that Christ wants to say to them, but they could not bear them now. It gives you the idea that Christ wants to reveal the other things at a time when they would be able to bear it, correct? They couldn't bear it now. There will become a time when they could bear it. Then he, Christ, not someone else, will then say these other things that he is longing to reveal. Once that barrier is broken. Here is how he will say these further things. He said it, says it in the next verse. How be it, verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. And people read that and conclude, oh, we have graduated from one teacher to another teacher. Christ finished teaching and now we have someone called the Spirit of Truth. No, 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 no. The Spirit of Truth is how Christ continues to speak in a different form, in a different manner. Not in the flesh like he did to his disciples, but by the Spirit internally. He is the one who continues to do that. He is the only one, brothers and sisters, qualified to guide into all truth. He is the truth. <clears throat> That's the connection between the Father and the Son. The Father in the Son is how we are connected with heaven. Now, it says here, you know, He teaches you whatever He shall hear. He will speak. He will show you things to come and people many times read that and like I said and I, I realize that people say but look you know how can it be Christ because it sounds like someone else that's why we have to remember he was speaking in parable I keep saying that the whole time right because this is this point is missed about this passage and as a result of that the whole passage is misunderstood we have introduced another teacher of truth besides Christ that's outrageous if you're a Christian Stop and think about that for a minute. We have someone other than Christ as our teacher and our guide into all truth, and we call ourselves Christian? That is outrageous. That is ludicrous. We don't, it doesn't hit us as much as it should because we hear it all the time. We have become desensitized to it. Jesus, you're a Christian, right? You believe Jesus who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Utter exclusivity. And yet we believe there is another teacher who does the same job other than Christ? And you think that's okay to believe that? That is not Christianity. 
That's what all the other religions believe, say, right? They say, well, you have Jesus, we have Muhammad, and we have Buddha, and we have Krishna, and we have I don't know who what. And every one of these is a teacher and guide into all truth. Well, Christianity has a form of that nonsense called, there's another teacher besides Christ. This one we'll call God the Holy Spirit, a different person to Christ. It's the exact same outrageous dishonoring of Christ. You realize that? Strong words, right? But we're going by what Jesus said. You're, int you're introducing someone other than Christ and giving him the qualification and the role of Christ. And you don't want us as Christians to be upset? That's what Jesus reveals to us. Verse 14. Let's look at verse 14. He shall glorify me. Speaking of the spirit of truth. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. He says, see, look, brother. Listen, you're going on and, and you're going through your rant here. Look, it says here he shall glorify me. You're, you're making a lot of noise over nothing. That's obviously someone else. Who glorifies Christ? Why don't you think about that for a minute? It says, he shall glorify me. He receives of mine. He will show it unto you. How is the Son glorified? Who does that? Okay, the Father. That is very true. Because the Father is the source of the Spirit of Truth. The Spirit of Truth proceeds from the Father. The Holy Ghost which proceeds from the Father. That's how the Son is glorified. He's glorified by the Father fulfilling what Christ will pray to the Father and ask Him for. In other words, Christ is glorified when the Father makes real or fulfills the promise and makes real the words that Jesus is speaking here. I want to look at a couple of passages before Jesus said this and after, just to confirm this fact. I'll tell it to you first before we read the passage. It's when, when the Father gives the Spirit of His Son to the believer that Christ has glorified and that Christ is magnified and exalted, and the words that he said become a living reality. Look at John chapter 13. This is just a little earlier. John chapter 13. It's in the same evening, but just a little earlier. And we're looking here at who it is that actually glorifies Christ. John 13, verses 30 down to 32. John chapter 13, verse 30. Speaking of Judas Iscariot, he then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. So now how many are left? Eleven. Eleven. And now Jesus begins, the traitor is gone. And now Jesus begins to speak openly and more intimately, revealing precious truths to the disciples. Verse 31, therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified where? In him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straight away glorify him. You ever wondered about this verse? Jesus here was not speaking in parables, right? He was speaking plainly. He's saying, who is the one that glorifies him? It's the Father. And there's something about this connection, about the Father being in him and him being in Christ, that that's the source of his glory. So when he says a little earlier, uh, when he says a little later, in the same evening, speaking now in parables about the spirit of truth that proceeds from the Father. And he says, he shall glorify me. Who is he referring to? Someone else who will glorify him? No, he's referring to the Father. And then a little later, when Jesus finishes speaking in these parables, he's praying to his Father in John 17. We don't, we don't have to read the verse, but we're familiar with it. Where he says, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. You remember that verse? Who is he asking for glory from? From the Father. So you have before it, he's speaking plainly, he says, the Father glorifies me. After it, he's speaking plainly, he says, Father, glorify me. And in the middle, in John 16, he's speaking in parables, he says, the spirit of truth that will testify of me, he will glorify me. He cannot be speaking about anyone else. The source of the glory that the Son receives is the Father. There isn't someone else that he receives glory from. The glory comes only from the true God. And if someone says, well, it sounds like someone else when he spoke there in John 16. Yes, it does. Because he was speaking there in parables. So let's go back now to where we started. John 16 and verse 25. John chapter 16 and verse 25. 
Now his words will make a lot more sense, hopefully. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs or in parables, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. That's what these parables were all about. Proverbs about showing and revealing the Father in illustrations. But a time is coming when Jesus will do that no longer in parables or in Proverbs, but He will do that plainly. He will reveal the Father. When will... Verse 25. 1625. When will Christ do that? At the day, he says, at that day when you know the Father is in me and I in you and you in me. That day is when the fulfillment of this promise of the Comforter comes. That's when he speaks openly or plainly. And this is why we're saying in this, in this passage that we read, Jesus was not speaking plainly. If you take his words plainly or literally or at face value, you will misunderstand his words. You will come to the conclusion that he must be talking about someone else. You cannot do that. And this is why we need to look at the whole passage in its context. Notice how Jesus gives his qualification for being the only one who can reveal the Father. Verse 26, continuing, At that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and I'm coming to the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Was Jesus speaking plainly here or not? No. Think. I want you to think, okay? I know I'm asking you to think before lunch. I know, very, very challenging request. Okay, plain speaking. I'm not going to ask for a vote. It's plain speaking because he just finished telling them, look, I just spoke to you these things in, parable, in parables. A time is coming when I'll speak plainly. And listen, in that day, you're going to know something. You're going to be assured. You're going to be confirmed in something that the Father loves you because you loved me and have believed that I came out from God. What's he referring to when he says I came out from God? He's referring to the fact that he is the son of God. The only begotten Son of God. That's not a proverb. It's not a parable. That's plain speech. He came out from God. The equivalent of that is that he was begotten of the Father. That is brothers and sisters. That's what qualifies him to be the only one who can reveal the Father. That's what qualifies him to be the only one who is the way to the Father. You with me? No man knows the Father but... The Son, and he to whomsoever, the Son will reveal him. Verse 29. Notice the disciples knew that. Look at verse 29. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou what? Plainly, and speakest no proverb. Amen. So when Jesus says, I came out from God, that's not a proverb. It's not a parable. That's not an allegory. That's not a metaphor like some people would have us believe, that Christ's sonship is a metaphor. You know, it's amazing. We take the words that Jesus said plainly, we turn them into a parable and a metaphor, and the words that he spoke in a parable, we make them literal and plain. That's turning the tables totally upside down. And the conclusion of this bizarre way of reading the Bible is you deny that Christ is truly the Son of God, and you make the comforter someone other than Christ. That is not Christianity. You know, twisting the Bible is a dangerous thing. You can come up, you, you can reach weird, strange conclusions and ideas that pass as fundamental beliefs because they're held commonly or for so long. It doesn't matter. Jesus says, you know, you worship God in vain, teaching for commandments, the things of men, the traditions of men. It doesn't matter how deeply entrenched the tradition is. So coming out from God is plain speech. They understood that. Look, look at verse 30. Now we are sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. What are they talking about? By this we believe, we're sure now, that you indeed came forth from God. You know what they're referring to? They believe, they're saying, we believe you are the Son of God. We believe you are qualified. You're plainly speaking now. You're qualified that you can do this. No man needs to ask you anything. You know everything because you are the Son of God. Jesus said to them just earlier, 
In the previous verses we read, the Father loves you because you believe that I came out from God. What is this coming out of God? What is this that thou camest forth from God that they're referring to? The parallel, it's, it's his sonship. The parallel verse is when Jesus asked his disciples once, you know, who do men say that I am? And they said, they say this, that, and the other. And he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter, the Bible says, answered him and says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said he was going to build his church on that rock on that foundation. When Peter made that declaration, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, that's equivalent to saying, we believe that thou camest forth from God. That's the foundation of Christianity. Coming forth from God is his sonship. You see, brothers and sisters, God only had one begotten son. He didn't have many, right? Christ is the only begotten son of God. You know what that means? He is the only one qualified to be the way to the Father and to reveal the Father. Is that a quick comment? Because comment? I know we're recording and I don't want to interrupt that. Some say that they, that's because of his birth, the only son, birth on this earth. Okay, birth on this earth, uh, all right. Uh, Christ's birth on earth is not what qualifies him to know the Father. Christ's birth on earth was a revelation of the Son of God. It was the Son of God who was born of a woman, born, made under the law, the Bible tells us. So his birth on earth is not coming forth from God. That's his birth as a man, as the son of man. He was the son of God before then. So thank you for that. That's a good point to clarify. So when Jesus was speaking the parable of the comforter, he was revealing to his disciples how he will reveal the father in an intimate way to the believer. This is what it's all about. How he will continue to do that. It is Christ who is that comforter. He's the one who says, I won't leave you comfortless. I will come to you. The qualification for him to do that is that he is God's only begotten son. Amen. If the comforter is someone other than Christ, then pray tell me, what is his qualification to reveal the Father to you and me? What is his qualification? The son who knows the Father best, you've put aside and you want someone else to show you the Father who is not God's only begotten son. And you still think this is Christianity? People wake up. This deception is a serious, serious problem. It's not some light thing. It's not something people say, well, you believe this way, brother. I believe this way. When we get to heaven to find out. That sounds so nice and, and pretty and, 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 and flowery. But brothers and sisters, this is not how we deal with finding truth. You believe this and you believe that. We need to examine the truths we believe practically, realistically. Who is your teacher? Who is your comforter? Because your teacher to truth, your comforter, is the one who reveals the Father to you. The only one who knows him is his son. How, how, I don't understand, I honestly find it very difficult to understand. How is it that you put the son aside and you think there is someone else who is equally qualified to show you the Father? Unbelievable. Utterly unbelievable. Not logical and definitely not biblical, that's very true. So the disciples knew that it was Christ who was coming, brothers and sisters. They knew that. They didn't have a problem with that. Today we have a very, very serious problem. Galatians 4.6. Here's another, another point. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6. This one is not a parable, okay? This is Paul speaking plainly. Galatians 4, 6. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That's the comforter that Jesus spoke about in a parable. It's the spirit of his son. This is whom the father sends, right? Remember Jesus says, I'll pray the father, he will send you another comforter. Here is how Paul understood it. He says, the father sends who? The spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now this is... A point here I want to make. Elsewhere, this is referred to as the spirit of adoption. When it says Abba Father, it means we call the Father our Father. That's in, in Romans, he talks about it as the spirit of adoption. We become, brothers and sisters, you get this. We become adopted into the family of God. We become sons and daughters of God. Only by one means. If we receive what? The spirit of His Son. In other words, the father of the son becomes our father as well. We call him Abba, father. That spirit of adoption is only possible through the spirit of the son. Now, if 
you do not receive the spirit of the Son. If you receive the spirit as someone else, is it then the spirit of adoption? The spirit of receiving. Is it, you know what I'm saying? Is it the spirit of adoption? God had only one son. How he adopts you into his family is by giving you the spirit of his son. If you don't receive the spirit of his son, you don't receive the spirit of adoption. You know what ends up happening? Amazingly enough, you end up having to play the role of a son of God. Because you do not have the true spirit of adoption. You have someone else. So your sonship to God can only be a metaphor and a role play. It cannot be real. You know what I'm talking about? You know, a lot of people believe that God is actually playing a role of father and son. Well, if you have to, you need to extend that and say, well, if you don't receive the spirit of the son, then your sonship to God is nothing better than a role play and a metaphor. Think about that. It's a very serious matter. The final witness and the final verse is 1 John chapter 2. In 1 John, the apostle here is writing, and this, is, this to me is, is like the final clincher of the whole matter. You know, so if someone still wants to say, well, you know, well, no, 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 no. Sounds good, but I don't believe it. Well, here's, here's one nail, final nail in the coffin, so to speak. 1 John chapter 2. Before we read the verse, I want you to think about something. John here is writing a letter to the church. As an elder, he is advanced in years. He has been a Christian all this time. This is the same John who wrote the Gospel of John, who recorded for us the parable of the Comforter. In his letter, he is encouraging the believers, and he reminds them of something about Christ that has to do with this Comforter. 1 John 2 and verse 1, it says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Sadly, in our English translation, something is missed here. Because the word comforter is used in the Greek. The word comforter is used in this verse. Do you know what has been translated as in this verse? Advocate. If you look it up in the Greek, if you look it up in the lexicon, you will find that the word advocate is the exact same Greek word for comforter, parakletos, used in the gospel that John wrote. And this is the fifth and final occurrence of this word in the entire New Testament. John is telling us basically, John who heard the words of Christ that evening, that parable, and he lived as a Christian for all these years, he's telling that, them and us what he understood and who he understood the Comforter to be. He's saying it's who? Jesus Christ the righteous. John understood that. Do we understand that? That's the question. It's Jesus Christ, and he's speaking here what? Plainly, okay? It's not a parable. This is plain speech. This is how John, brothers and sisters, understood. He was there that evening. We weren't there. He wrote the, down the account for us, and here he is as an elder, writing a letter to encourage the believers, and he's telling them, listen, remember, if you fall, don't forget something. We have a comforter, Jesus Christ the righteous. That's who the comforter is. He understood the parable. Today, most people don't understand the parable. They actually think there might be two comforters. That's absolutely impossible. So do you have the comforter? John knew who he was. Do we know who he is? Not just do we know who he is, but do we have him? That's what really matters. Do we have Christ in us, dwelling in us, revealing to us the Father, Connecting us with the Father is the only way you can be connected. That's the only way you can be adopted into the family of God to truly become the Son of God and the daughter of God. That's what the Gospel is about, brothers and sisters. It's about restoring us. God gave His Son to restore us. He didn't give His Son and someone else to finish off what the Son did not finish off. His Son is the entire plan of salvation. The whole thing. So I want to challenge you with that thought. And hopefully now you have an idea of next time when you're confronted with someone who says, another comforter, perhaps now you can uh, explain to them, well, hold on a minute. Jesus was speaking in? In parables. That's why it's called the parable of the, of the comforter. If you were blessed by this video, then you will get more insights from this one right here. And if you want to study the Bible with me and strengthen your faith, 
then join me and enroll at the Bible Academy right here. I'll see you there.